Thank you. So first, don't worry, you're not crazy. I'm really using the opening of Star Wars with the theme of 2001, A Space Odyssey, just because I don't want to get into trouble with John Williams. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. So I know that you are coming from very far, from, far from outer space, and you came here to find a solution for a really annoying problem we have in software development. Let me sum up what the problem is. So usually in a software architecture, we put our business logic inside our backends. This is a best practice because we don't want that logic to be duplicated in all the consumers we may have, such as Android or iOS mobile application, responsive web apps, desktop clients, backend calling our backends, and so on. Here, I have represented one domain, which is a rail booking system with several features, such as performing a search for train, going to the destination of the user, select train with fare, etc. And because we don't put our users in front of our backend, since they don't know how to speak JSON, right, we also develop frontends in which you will be able to find as well the features. So it means that on each side of the network, we have developed features using the English natural language, usually, to express all the richness and the subtlety of our domain. But in between, we put something named REST, which has only four words of vocabulary. So the impact of that is that the front end, when the user wants to perform a search for a train going to his destination, the front end will have to translate it into create a search resource. On the other end, the back end, when you receive create a search resource, it will have to convert it back to the original intent of the user that was performing a search for train going to his destination. Another example, select train with fare. That time, we'll map it on something like update a sub-resource selection inside the search resource. And here we can ask yourself if we are not a bit mad. Because by the way, it's a bit arbitrary. We could have done something like create a selection resource. Why are we a bit mad there? Because in fact, the user, he asks you to, to search for train going to his destination. He never asks you to create a search resource, right? But the thing is that your backend, this is exactly what it exposes as a web API. Knowing that he is responsible for the business logic, it's a bit mad. And I'm pretty sure that you can clearly see that even though those sentences are equivalent regarding REST, they don't have exactly the same meaning, right? In the second use case, you don't see any notion of trains or destination. I'm also pretty sure that when you have user stories to develop, you rather like them to look like the first sentence and not the second one. And if, unfortunately, you have created a search resource as a user story, I'm strongly advising you to fire a product owner, but that's, not, uh, that's another story. So here, why we have that problem? Because with REST, we have to translate everything with four verbs of vocabulary. This is what we call an impedance mismatch. So if you want, a more, so if you want to understand from where it comes, that comes from the uniform interface of REST. To explain that, we have to be back before 2000, and at that time, when you wanted to talk with a backend, the only thing you had was the HTTP protocol. But the way to use HTTP was really specific to that backend. That was a mess. So REST came in early 2000 and said, we will standardize a bit the thing. We'll say that we have resources on each backend, and we will handle the lifecycle of those resources using the CRUD paradigm that will map on the HTTP methods. So to create a resource post, to read, get, update, patch, put, and delete, delete, right. This is the uniform interface. Maybe you know that, but REST vo was formalized by Roy Fielding in 2000 in his PhD thesis. He warned us about one limitation of that pillar of REST. He said that since the information is transferred in a standardized form rather than one form which is specific to the application needs, we will degrade the efficiency of the system. So in a way, he warned us about that loss of meaning. So to sum up, here, let's imagine that that astronaut is the business intent of your backend, and in the back, the black hole is the uniform interface of REST. The result is that 
all the business intent is engulfed in your REST API, and as a result, you are still creating CRUD APIs, and everything in developers' life is CRUD-based, right? So I didn't introduce myself. My name is Julien Topsu. I'm a technical coach at Chodo, which is a French consultancy company. And at Chodo, we created a startup that helps people to travel from the Earth to the Moon. The name is Columbia Express. Yes, because we didn't know how to get uh, public funds for innovation. So that's a joke because that doesn't exist. But here, this is exactly the domain we will explore today on which I have applied an ancient technique that will help you to bring back the business intent in your API. So you will see that it really looks like a real booking system because, by the way, I worked at Expedia where I applied this. So you can say if you want to do a one-way or a round trip, you have to select your departure spaceport, let's say GFK Space Center, and you want to arrive on Mare Cognitum on the moon. When you hit search, you have now all the possible outbound space train going to the moon, and for each of them, you have fares. And here, we'll select the first class fare. By doing that, you can see that the panel on the right has been populated with my selection, but for now, I still not click on the, I can't click on the book button because the selection is not complete yet. On the other side, the UI has changed to display me only the inbound space train uh, that are compatible with my selection. That's why I'll only have two of them. So I will select the first class fare for the first one, and now I'm able to book. And by eating book, my trip is ready. And what you can notice there is that for only 500 euros, you are able to do round trip with Columbia Express. So let's say we will never become a unicorn and we won't last long. So that's the domain we will explore today, like I said, that we, and to show you the technique that will help you to bring back the business intent in your API, but it has also a good side effect that is purely technical. So now I will do a little demonstration regarding REST, and I think it will be perhaps the best demonstration of REST you will ever see in your life. And now I have some pressure. So, okay. Let's restart once again. We would like to make a search, okay? And we will see what is happening on the network when the front end tries to retrieve the, the space train for the outbound. Basically, this is a request. Is that big enough? Yes? Okay. So how has been built the request? You have the URL here. It starts with searches. This is the name of the collection of my main resource, search the ID of the search, and after that, here you have the sub-collection space trains. And because the front-end only wants the outbound ones, there is a query parameter here, bound, equal outbound. Okay, quite easy. So for the rest of the demonstration, we will move to Postman. Okay, so I will perform a search, and now I will replicate the request we just have seen. This is exactly the same one, right? With bound equal outbound. OK, I send it to the back end. It's working. That's fine. Great. Let's imagine now that my product owner say to me, Julian, now we will open the Mars market. And by doing that, we would like to offer a new feature to our users, uh, which is the multi-destination. So it means that now they will be able to do trips from the Earth to the Moon, then to Mars, and being able to be back to Earth. In that kind of trip, Outbound and inbound doesn't mean anything. So since they can do unlimited number of journeys, we rather like to talk about the first journey, the second one, and so on and so on. So I, I've been asked to do that modification on the back end. So the back end is there. That's a Spring Beautiful uh, Kotlin back end. Here, this is the controller. You can see here, this is the, the route to retrieve the space train with the request parameter bound, like we said. Bound is just an enumeration. OK, great. So now that I need to do that modification, I will change bound for journey index. OK, and I will change also the type to an integer. Because I don't want to do the wall feature in front of you, I will just convert it back to a bound. OK, so it means that when the journey index is 1, it will be, uh, sorry, 0, it will be 
outbound, and when the journey index is one, it will be inbound. Okay, I just have to do that little modification there, and now I can restart the backend. So can you tell me what is the impact of that modification I just made? Do you have an idea? Can you speak louder? So yes, but regarding the consumers. Yeah, I broke the contract. So to, to, to check that, I, have, I will just go back to Postman here. So this endpoint should still work because I didn't change anything. And here to retrieve the outbound trains, it won't work. The backend said, I was expecting a journey index, quite normal. So it means that all the consumers, they will have to change their code to reflect the breaking change. So here, instead of using bound, it will be journey index. And here, instead of outbound, it will be zero. OK, so send that, and it works. So what we have just learned is that if you change your URL and your request parameters, you will break your API. But you knew that already, right? You knew that already, right? <laughs> OK, that's not the biggest part of the demonstration, in fact. Here, I have the front end, OK? So it has been developed using React and currently running in a separate node process. I think you quite agree I didn't touch any piece of code of JavaScript and I didn't restart the process. Yes? OK. So let's be back to the front end now. And let's see what, what is the impact on the front end. So I will try to do a search now. And who thinks it, it won't work? OK, why do some people think it will work? Like Sorry? Like yeah, because it works. <laughs> so what is happening? OK, that's magic. Let's see what is going on on the network. So let's restart, uh, not restart, but refresh here the page. And you can clearly see here that my front end was smart enough to detect the change without, ha without having to change any piece of code. And that's a better demonstration, right? You want to know how it works? Yes, OK. So let's see how we can craft domain-driven design web APIs using REST. So you have to know that, in fact, we already have everything in REST to do such things, but we have some problems that are preventing us to do so. Four problems, exactly, according to me. But <laughs> so the first problem is that we have false beliefs regarding REST. Let me explain you that. So let's take one feature, this one. So this feature helps a user to book what he has selected. So it creates a booking forming selection. If you have to map that in REST using an HTTP method and a base URL, what will you use? Post, and for the URL? Bookings, Bookings yes. So people usually do that kind of stuff. That's fine. But let's imagine now, so everyone understand why this is a post. We are creating a resource. So basically, according to the uniform interface, it has to be a post. Let's take another use case. This one is helping someone to rebook what he has already booked in the past, because he knows, for example, that his train is departing every Friday at the same schedule, so he doesn't want to give all the criteria of the search, just saying that particular train in the future. So it creates a new booking from an existing one, but it doesn't change the existing booking that we want to keep. If you have to map that in REST as well, what will you use? Patch is to modify. I want to create a new booking. Post. And the URL? There are several options there. And we will talk about them. Some people do that, post-booking as well. Why? Because we are creating a booking. But I can, I can, uh, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure that now you can see the smell. Because here, in the first use case, we, to, select what, to book what we have selected, we just have post-bookings and search ID. Why? Because uh, since the selection is a sub-resource of the search and it doesn't have any ID, the idea of the search is enough to find it back, OK? So here, the problem is that we have a loss of notion of selection. I book what I have selected. 
Okay. Second use case, the problem is that we have a semantic confusion with the previous one. On the same endpoint, you have different use cases, so it's quite hard to understand in which you are, right? You create a booking, but for, it, for which purpose? Quite hard. So in the second use case, some people are doing that instead to fix the problem, post rebookings. So it can be a great solution. Unfortunately, not in my case, and I will explain you why. So because for the domain expert, rebooking is, not an, uh, is an action, not an entity. It means that you have two ways to book from the selection or an existing booking, but once created, this is exactly the same thing. So if you say that you have a rebooking resource and a booking resource, sounds like they are different, right? But that's not the case. They are exactly the same thing with the same life cycle. Furthermore, REST must not lead the design of your business domain. Because if you would have used something else like a message broker, you wouldn't have that problem, right? That's the same thing with Spring, by the way. <laughs> so, and furthermore, the worst problem maybe is that rebooking is pseudo-functional. So it means that for the people that are on the product part, if they see people, uh, if they see, sorry, uh, developers saying rebooking and booking like it was two different things, they might be confused. And it will bring a lot of accidental complexity in your organization, so you should not do that. I have a really funny uh, feedback on that, and, but I don't have time for the talk. We can discuss uh, after the talk if you want. On the real time, uh, a real time, sorry. A real thing that happened for 15 years in a company about that kind of thing. So to fix the problem, I'm proposing you to align with what the user is doing. For example, the user is actually in, in, on his booking, he wants to rebook it. So let's say, let's go to the, rebook, to the booking here with booking and the idea of the booking, and happen what we call the classifier and rest rebooking, rebook. And now I'm pretty sure that in less than a second, you are able to understand the meaning of that URL. Quite easy. I still have to comply with the uniform interface, so because here I'm creating a booking, it has to be a post. And now we are aligned with what the expert wants, because we have two ways to create booking from the selection and the rebooking. But once created, this is exactly the same. There is a single endpoint to retrieve all kinds of booking, with get, bookings, and the idea of the booking. Okay? But maybe that solution annoys some of you because you heard that we cannot use verbs in REST. Who heard that already? Okay. So you have to know that this debate is a false debate. <laughs> Let me explain you why. First, the nomenclature we are all using, you know, with the collection with an S, the ID of the resource, the sub-resources and so on, it's quite hard to to find the origin of that. If you take a look at Royce Fielding uh, thesis, at no time he said to you how to build your URLs. He just said that it has some constraints, it has to uniquely identify one representation of your resource, and your URL should last long, but that's all. And even his examples are opaque, by the way. But he goes, so the only thing you can't do, in fact, is to use verbs that are at odds with the HTTP method. For example, get create forbidden. Why? Get should retrieve data, create in the URL should means that maybe you create something confusing. Do not do that. You should not do that. That's the only thing you can't do. Okay? So, Roy Fielding goes further because in his thesis, it said that at no time, the client or the server need to know or understand the meaning of a URL. That's weird, because I'm pretty sure that all of us, when we develop front-ends, for example, we do something like that. I would like to retrieve a particular search. So I know that the base URL is searches, I'm opening the ID, I will get the search, right? If I want to get the space train inside, okay, let's concatenating slash space train. And he says that we should not do that. Why? Because if the consumers don't know how the URL is built, it won't be impacted if the URL change. And you know why? Because it won't be able to call the backend. No, no one gets it. <laughs> so in fact, there is a mean. But 
and this mean is one of the secrets of the magic trick I showed you at the beginning. So how can we change the URL without having any impact on the, um, on the consumers? But to explain you how to do that, we need to go through other problems first. And the second problem is that usually we are confusing model and business when we are building web APIs. Let me explain you that. What is the business actually? The business is what the user is doing. When she wants to select a train with a fare, she's on the outbound trains page. She selects the fare she wants on the space train she wants, right? That's the business. On the other side, you have the model. This is what, how we solve the problem using code. Basically, here I have a search resource. Inside it, I have available space trains outbound and inbound space train, and then I have a sub-resource selection in which I will store the selected space train numbers. This is one way to, fix, to solve that problem, right? And there is some other ways. I could have used Booleans directly in a variable space train, seeing this one has been selected, for example. But the problem is not there. The problem is that each time we want to create a REST API on top of it, we just align the API according to the structure of the code. So it means that if you want to select something or change the selection, you will do something like that, a patch on the sub-resource selection inside the search. But if you change, change the structure of your code, what's about your API? So it means that, in fact, we are coupling our consumers with our implementation instead of the behavior of the features. And by the way, once again, the user wants to select a fare on a train, never asks you to update a sub-resource selection in the search resource, right? And when we are building that kind of API, in the worst case, when the domain is quite complex and you don't have any um, UX researcher, you will build really bad user experience. OK, let's imagine that for a rail booking system, the front end say to you, OK, now update your selection inside your search. Doesn't mean anything. I want to select a train with a fare. I don't want to update my selection, right? But don't worry, it doesn't happen much. Most of the time, this is what we have. A really nice front end and a ugly back end. Why? Because the front end still has to comply with the business intent, right? He won't say to the users, OK, update your sub-resource selection. No. He said, OK, now you are able to select your train and your fare. But your backend is still exposing a CRUD-based API, such as update, so on. So it means that your front end has to do that translation, that adaptation. It also means that all your consumers will have to do such things. And this is duplicated everywhere. This is what I call accidental complexity of adaptation, because we are exposing our model, our implementation, instead of our behaviors. So to fix that, quite easy, let's take that adaptation and encapsulate it in the backend. That was quite easy to say. <laughs> because, in fact, there is one problem with encapsulation with REST. I really like that meme because if you know Windows, there is the task manager that is not responding, and <laughs> Obi-Wan said, you are supposed to destroy them, not join them. <laughs> so maybe some people don't know what is encapsulation. That's not a problem if you don't know. I mean, everyone knows what encapsulation, encapsulation means, right? OK, so is that encapsulation? No, why? Because here, in that class, I only have attributes. So in the search, I have an ID, criteria, space train selection, I only get a status. So it means that I, have, uh, I don't have any behaviors attached to the search class. So all the consumers of the search inside your code will have to implement the business logic of the search. And they will have to do defensive code as well. Why? For example, you have made a search for trains from Paris to Barcelona, and then, OK, you want to do a set criteria, and you change the destination to London. Leave it as it, what happened? It means that your search is now in an inconsistent way. Why? Because your criteria said that you want to go to London, 
but all the trains go to Barcelona. So that's why this is a bad pattern that uh, is called by Martin Fuller an anemic domain. So we rather like to do encapsulation. So that's one of the pillars of object-oriented programming. So instead of having setters, we will expose behaviors through functions. And those functions encapsulate the states, you know, and ensures that the transition of those states will be made in a consistent way. So for example, we will have a change destination inside the search. And each time this is called, the search will itself reset the phase trains. It will remain in a consistent state. That's basically encapsulation. Does some, do some people code like that? Yes, a few. OK, but the problem is after that. So when we want to expose that as a REST API, we do exactly the opposite. Why? Because with REST, we are just able to serialize attributes, right? What will you do with the functions? So it means that REST with the encapsulated behaviors to expose states. It also means that the consumers using the correct paradigm has a kind of super getter setters on each field because they can do the work thread on them. And it's a real nightmare because if they try to do inconsistent modification with patch and put, on the back end, you will have to perform really complicated validation and so on. So <coughs> we can ask yourself once again if we are not a bit mad. Why? Because we try to put business logic in backends. And on one side, we have REST, which is CRUD based. On the other side, we have the database, which is CRUD based. And we try to link everything together. And there is a lot of sense and so on, a lot of meaning and so on. Why not just, you know, creating CRUD based backend as well? It would be easier, right? And if we, are if we are doing so, what just not, you know, use progress REST? that exposes directly our tables as a REST API. And no code will kill us all. No. Why? Because we need to implement complex business logic that cannot be put inside the, 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 the database, right? And it's quite hard to test the database. So it also means that we have to find a way to keep that business logic inside the API. Do some people here do domain-driven design who know about domain-driven design? Yes? Do you, do you want to know the real meaning of CRUD? CRUD means completely ridiculous and useless domain-driven design. <laughs> Everything is CRUD, what you bother about, you know? Just tell me if this is read, update, get, delete. But don't worry, we have a mean to go over the CRUD paradigm. Just to show you one example of encapsulation, and this is the end of that part, Remember when I had, on the same endpoint, two use cases? The only mean I had to make the difference was through the payload. Because in the second one, I, I pass here a booking ID. It means that maybe this is a rebooking, right? This is one example of loss of meaning through the encapsulation. OK, so let's sum up the problem. The user, she wants to select a fare on the train. This is what she does. On the other side, this is the ugly backend with the patch of the selection inside the search. Here, I'm using JSON patch. If you don't know JSON patch, it's a way to have a fine-grained operation on the modification. So for example, here, the operation is add in the subpath selected space train of the selection. And I'm adding the train number, this, and the fare with that code. That's important to read, you know, because I could have done something else, like uh, a choice for a seat option near the window or near the ale. So here we have two problems. I talked about that already, that complex adaptation that has to be made on the consumers, because it's not aligned with the business intent, with the URL there. The second one is the encapsulation, because you all had to take some time and spend some cognitive load to understand what is the meaning of that request. So to fix that problem, once again, we can just align with what is doing the user. Like that. OK, so she's actually in a search, searches and the ID of the search, and she wants to select a particular train with the number here, space train number, and a particular 
code of fair, fair code, and then slash select. And now I'm pretty sure that less than a second, you are all able to understand what is the intent of that API, right? And I still have to comply once again with the uniform interface. Since here I'm creating a selection, I have to do a post. And on the backend side, I can keep the domain as I want because the adaptation will be made inside the controller, right? So if you are using a hexagonal architecture or clean architecture, maybe you know that with the left adapters. There are some people here doing hexagonal architecture? Yes? Okay, great. But we still have a problem, right? Because I told you that at no time the client must know how to build the URL. So how the front end can know that he can call that particular business-oriented URL? So to answer to that, we need to dig to, into the last problem. The last problem is that each time we build an API, the API is anemic regarding the workflow. What does it mean? Here, I represented the two workflows of my backend. OK, so we have, the, so that's basically an event storming for the people who know that workshop. So here, I have a one-way search and a round-trip search. I have all the phases of a round-trip search. That workflow can be illustrated as it. I mean, using my API, right? So first, I'm creating a search, submitting my criteria. Then I will retrieve the outbound trends. I will select one of them. I will also, after that, retrieve the inbound train, select one of them. And once my selection is complete, I will do post bookings. I create the booking, right? But I have a question for you. From the API perspective, how can we know that we must proceed in that particular order? And don't say swagger. <laughs> no? Yes, but we'll see just after. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> um, but also, what is preventing the front end from displaying the inbound trends before the outbound ones, trying to retrieve the inbound trend for a one-way trip, or calling the booking creation endpoint, although the selection is not yet complete? In fact, nothing. Why? Because the API is anemic, usually. Because only the consumers implement the business workflow. But if you think about it, if the backend is responsible for the business, who, will, who should implement the business workflow? The API gateway? No? The backend, right? So the, there is here an example of, you know, of that problem, because for example, if you want in the front end to display the booking button, you will have to implement business logic. Basically, here you will have to check if the search is a round trip, if the outbound has been selected, and the inbound as well, and then you can display the booking button. So it means that if you make some evolution with multi destination, you will have to put logic there as well. And that logic, you will have to replicate it everywhere in all the consumers. So really, here, some part of the business logic are leaking to the consumer as well. Why? Because we don't implement the workflow on the back end. So once again, the solution is quite easy to say. <laughs> Let's encapsulate the workflow inside the API. How could, but is that even possible? <coughs> Did you heard about the Richardson maturity model? Yes. So Richardson categorized REST application in four levels. Level one, uh, zero, sorry, the, you are not REST. Level one, you have resources. Level two, you are ending the life cycle of your resources using the HTTP method. And people stop there. But since the really beginning of REST, you have the hypermedia controls. And this is where we will find the solution for the problems we've just seen. So, hyper, hypermedia control has also another name, ATOS, which is a really ugly name. For hypermedia as the engine of application state, and I really like engine of application state because it sounds like, you know, behavior. So what is ATOS? This is a linking system allowing you to expose the relationship between the domain objects, discover the domain, and encapsulate the business workflow. And I will do now a little demonstration of that. 
So here, let's go back to Postman. OK, so here, sorry, I will create a search by providing here the payload for the requests. So I'm just saying that I want to go from that departure spaceport to that arrival spaceport with that schedule, right? So usually, when you send that kind of request on the back end, here I want to create a search, what it does, it will serialize everything in your search. So in the search, remember what we have, the ID, the selection, the space train, and the criteria, right? Here, you will see what my back end is returning to the front end. Is that big enough? Yes? No? And now? Better? No? It's OK or not? OK, so let's see if it fits, if it will fit. Is that big enough? Please say yes. <laughs> yes. OK, so here I have the criteria, right? But you will see that I won't have any other information regarding um, the selection and so on. Instead of that, I will have links here. Each link has a name, a functional name like selection, and then here a URL. So it means that if I want to get the selection, quite simple, I take the URL as it and I request it using the uniform interface. So here, I will do a get, and I should retrieve the selection, right? Oh, that layout is really ugly. To paint you, will it work? Yes, that's better. OK. So you can see that inside my selection, I have no space train selected for now, and that's all. You can also see that there is some other links like search. So it means that with search, you will be able to go back to the search. OK, let's try. Let's take the URL as it. Let's do a get on that. And now I'm back to the search. There is a special link name self that will help you to know where you are. Here, I'm inside the search, as you can see here. So it means that with ATOS, you are able to discover the domain and the concept and how they are linked together but you can do fancier stuff as well. So you remember what the front end had to do to retrieve the outbound space train? It has to put a query parameter saying, OK, on the space train collection, I just want the bound equal to outbound, right? So here it will be more simple. Why? Because I have a special link which is purely functional, all outbounds, and I just have to do a request on that, and now I, I have all the possible outbounds. So it also means that from a developer perspective, we will reduce the cognitive load, because it, you don't have to care about how the UI is built. It has been serialized by the backend. So that's why here, if I go back here, if I change your index to something else, you won't be impacted. That one of the, this is the secret of the magic trick of the first part. Okay, so we can go further. Here in a space train, we have fares, right? And for each of them, there is a link to do the selection. So, okay, you want to select that? Get the link. So here, it will be opposed because I'm creating a selection. And now, the selection is created. So you can see here the outbound space train I've selected. With is fair, it's fair, the total price. And what is really nice here is that that time in the selection, the backend serialized a new link, which is create booking. That was not the case before, because before the selection was not complete. Now it has detected that the selection is complete, so it offers you the possibility to book. OK? So it also means that from the front-end standpoint, you cannot make any mistake. You don't have to implement business logic, because I will show you the only thing I had to do to um, display the booking button is to check that the link exists or not. If the link is not there, booking button is not available. OK. So let, to create the booking, Quite easy once again. This is the uniform interface, so I just have to do a post on this because I want to create the resource 
and the resource is created with my selection. You can see here it's booking with the ID of the booking. OK. Let's try a more complex use case. Let's go now to, to let's try now to do a round trip search. OK. So here in the round trip search, you will see that I have a new link, all inbounds. Why I display that? Just to show you the difference between all inbounds and all outbounds. So first, in a one-way trip, you will never have all inbounds. Here, the backend knows in which case you are and will serialize that link. What is important is that the backend remains stateless. It doesn't keep a session for that. This is when it serializes the payload that it detects in which UK you are, so it, it takes the decision to put the link or not. But what is nice here, you see, is that for June index equals zero, June index equals one, you don't have to, to do anything about it. That the, that's the backend job. And also, there is another query parameter I didn't talk about, which is only selectable set to false. In classic use case, the developer has to know when he has to pass that particular request parameter. In that case, you don't care. You just take the URL as it, and that's all. But if you really want to know why we have that, I will show you. Here, I will retrieve all the possible outbound trains. Okay? I will do one selection. This is exactly the same use case than the previous one. Okay? And now, once selected, you will see that inside the selection, I won't have any link to create a booking because the backend has detected that the selection is not complete yet. But instead of that, it will offer you a way to select a booking for the current selection because some of them are not compatible with maybe with what you have selected. So that's why here, the difference between all inbounds and inbound for current selection is the only selectable set to false or true. Once again, this is something that you don't have to handle as a developer. This is the backend which is serializing it for you. Let's imagine now I want to retrieve the inbound that might not be selectable, I mean compatible with my selection, and I would like to force a selection. What you will see here, there's a reset selection set to true for you. So it means that if you force it, you won't be in an inconsistent state because the backend has, you know, prepared everything. So I will select that, and now in my selection, you will see that I have the inbound, the outbound disappeared. I still cannot book, but it offered me a way to select a compatible outbound. So here I can go to that only selectable true link to get the less selectable outbound trains. And then you will see that on the selection that time, there is a reset selection set to false. Once again, you don't have to deal with it as a developer, prepared by the backend. OK, so let's select that particular train. And now my selection should be complete. So outbound, inbound, and now create booking link. So it means that with ATOS, we are now able to drive the workflow of the consumers and encapsulate the workflow inside the backend. OK. So what is really important is to understand that the links, the front end must try to understand how the URL are formed. That's really important. With that, you will have a better decoupling between the consumption and the implementation of your domain model. So the impedance mismatch we had at the really beginning, you know, was due to false beliefs regarding the REST nomenclature. Because we thought that we could not use verbs, while verbs are enriching the semantic of the MPI. Once again, the only thing you can't do is to do such uh, things like get create. That's confusing. We also had the straight exposition of our implementation in the API. So the consumer was coupled with the implementation. Instead of that, we should have made an adaptation that inside the backend, so we expose the business intent instead of the implementation, the structure of the code, I mean. We were exposing the state of the domain object, 
And now with HTOS, we are able to add links to expose as well the behaviors in the right, in the right resources. But one thing about that, that's not RPC. Because with RPC, you know, you don't create resources and so on and so on. Here, everything is resources because this is REST. So when you are calling a link, each time you have to comply with the uniform interface. So create bookings to create a booking. The only thing is that you don't have, you, you don't have to be symmetric for URLs between create, read, and update, and so on, right? But what is really important is to keep in mind that this is still not RPC. It's not the same thing. And we had a lack of workflow definition. Uh, the API was anemic inside the payloads, I mean, the, the work, um, regarding the workflow, sorry. And with ATOS, we are able to drive the, uh, the, um, uh, the workflow from the API with that hide and seek game, you know, with the, the links. So it means that the front end or the consumers, they can't do any mistake regarding the workflow. And with all those, you will be able to get back the business intent inside your API. So if you are interested, you are able to scan that QR code to retrieve the repository of that project. I hope that you learned something today. And I'm available if you have any question. Thank you very much. There's a question there. Do we have a microphone? Yes, that's coming. Okay, it's working. Uh, two questions, maybe it's the same answer. Um, you would not expose, so the, the front end does not know the URLs, okay? But it would have to know the identifiers you're exposing, right? That's something you would code into your front end? Sorry, uh, can you repeat? The identifiers you're exposing, like uh, create booking or yeah. get selection or something, this is something that is known to the front end that you yes, would incorporate have, in your code? Yeah, they have to know that. Okay. Because, in fact, um, they are now coupled with a business intent. It, it won't change... Um, like, you know, the implementation. The URL is implementation. So that's true that they have to know that now they need to retrieve all the outbounds. So the documentation you will have in your API saying, now if you want to get that, this is the link you need. But, yeah. Okay, makes sense. And the other question regarding identifiers, would you recommend using, um, let's say, um, something to identify which HTTP verb to use? So create always means post and... So Okay, so in fact, uh, I'm just using a really um, based HTL, which is one representation of the link. You have some other representation with which you can specify which uh, method to use. You have several ways to do that. There is JSON API. Uh, I don't remember the user one, but you also have the affordance. So with the affordance, in, and basically that's implemented by Spring ATOS. Let's, try, let's see if I am able to retrieve that. Spring ATOS affordance. Uh, you will be able to specify which, which, um, which HTTP method, and like here, for example, method put. And, but you have to know that this is a, a special content type because otherwise, each time you will have a really big payload. And you can also have more information like that property is required, but you won't have the type of the property. OK, okay thanks. OK, thanks. That's the end of the session. So if you have any other question, you can ask me after the talk. Thank you very much. Yeah.